Bom dia a todos. Good morning, everyone. You are all welcome to the first event of this debate session during pandemic times. Today, we will address democracy and social movements, transformation of political actions in the cyberspace. It's a great honor to have here today Mrs. Marisa Mangu from the University of Brasilia, Mr. Gerbaud from King's College London, and Ming Shun Hu from the National Taiwan University. We also have here today Professor Harmut Glaser, who is an executive secretary for CGI in Brazil, who will formally open this event. Our speakers will be introduced shortly. I also would like to thank our speakers for his kindness to participate at this debate, which is a topic that is widely challenging as we have to address internet advancements in our society. It's a great honor to have renewed speakers with us today. I also like to thank our participants in the YouTube. There are two links for you to follow this presentation. One of the links with the floor with the original audio and the second link with the translation into Portuguese. If you have any questions, you may submit your questions via chat and your questions will be read and we'll try to address all questions at, during the Q&A session after all speakers' presentations. I have to tell you how glad I am with outcomes that we had achieved with CGI Brazil and Brazil C, which is the research center for UNB, University of Brasilia. Having said that, now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Harmut Glaser, who is the executive secretary for CGI.br. Thank you, Giuliano, for your kind words. On behalf of CGI-BR, which is the Executive Steering Committee in Brazil, once again, I'd like to welcome you all for being part of this webinar. Briefly, some housekeeping information for those who do not know us yet. CGI-BR is stewarded by a multi-sectorial group with 21 advisors, which represent the whole Brazilian society. It is very important to highlight that in Brazil, internet is not a regular telecom service, but rather that is an added value service. And that's why governance is carried out under a multi-sectorial uh, format. What are uh, what are our missions? We have to look after domain registers throughout the country code.br where we allocate IP addresses. We drive technical standards to secure our networks and our services. We also recommend the procedures, norms, technical standards and operational standards to our internet in this country and also to promote research and development uh, related to the internet and all these novelties and the whole service that we provide Form at our uh, office. We also have the EGI, which is an internet school. This school is widely known with the 300 students that have graduated in our university. And we had prepared an activity with UNB that was supposed to be last April, but due to COVID-19, we decided them to organize this cycle of debates to address internet and democracy in times of pandemic. This is a topic which is very important, and this is a consequence of joint efforts between our EGI and our research group that is thinking over the relationship between society, states, RE, 
RSOC, which is RSOC, that is the research center from UNB, the University of our federal capital. And they designed this small workshop that will be deployed in three different webinars. Today, we have our first edition. Considering the current scenario, which encompass the development of internet as we are under isolation because of the pandemics, as well as lack of information about uh, the virus, the idea in our mind was to introduce a reflection about the potential of social, political, democratic interaction in the use and deployment of different technologies throughout internet, where we can debate all its impacts in our society now in a different context. In the rise of internet, we would expect that different technologies somehow, they would work as a democratic tool for different sectors of our society. So uh, technology would be applied for political issues. And now internet has worked as a support to political agencies and a number of movements conducted by our society. We have a public hearings conducted in the internet. We have discussions, legislative, public policies. By the internet, we can throw movements to advocate for issues and to modernize our society. We are also able to advocate for different causes that can be disseminated, mobilization strategies can be shared, and the dialogue is possible where social media, they work as a mean that can be applied by all citizens throughout the whole planet to allow connection among us. Today, we have those Black Lives methodology, which has been applied all over the country, as well as in Brazil where we have hashtag, hashtag break do apps to support the recent strike of uh, care apps like the Uber or the motorbikes uh, delivery group. The use of internet in the mobilization of social, economic and political issues, not only in Brazil, but all over in the US, Chile, Europe, Latin America and in the Eastern countries. It seems that right now social medias, they became important players and they influence widely our lives as part of the society. Conversely, there is another side of the coin, which is not so transparent parents and may fool ourselves, which seems that we had stepped into a very fruitful uh, field of internet. However, democratic process, they have some bias as the dissemination and the uh, disinformation of uh, our concerns that that has not been part of our history before and that is responsible to change some electoral processes all over they hold some politics and they lead to some actions that can be a mistake from a civil and, so and social perspective impairing our dialogues today we'll be promoting our first dialogue which will be part of a three cycles and we named it as transformation of political actions in the cyberspace with a main focus within the social movements, political actions, and digital practices. And with that, we are all invited to reflect and, th and to think about this phenomenon, cyber activism and several obstacles and challenges to be surpassed in the use of internet and digital tools. With that, the democratic potential will be indeed met in such a way that we'll collaborate to build up a fair society where we can coexist free thinking, free democracy, and diversity in opinions. With this debate that we are just officially opening now, our goal is to collaborate for this new normal life that we are all facing. Thank you so much for your time and participation. And now I hand over to Marisa, who is our coordinator and moderator. Thank you so much, Professor Glaser, for your kind words.
events. I also would like to thank the whole CGI team that make possible this partnership with our research center at uh, UNB, the Brasilia University. Let me briefly introduce our panelists. We have Professor Paulo Gerbel, who is a socio so, uh, so, sociologist and he is a professor at King's College in London. He's an author of several books addressing the digital field, and I feel so touched to be part of a panel where he is, because of his book uh, from 2012 it was exactly the first thing I read something about political activism, and then his book, despite all changes and transformation throughout the time, it is still um, a source of inspiration, not just for myself, but also for my students. I would like to thank you so much, Professor Gerbaud, for your participation. Professor Min So Hu, he's also uh, in the field of sociology. He's a professor of uh, Taiwan University with several publications about social movements, digital activism, everything I know about this topic and everything that is going on in Hong Kong is thanks to his articles. And he is also an author of a great book published last year about a social movement comparing that social movement in Hong Kong and Taiwan called the challenge based in Beijing Hong Kong umbrella movement. Thank you so much, Professor Ming Shouhu. I know that you are on holidays. It's quite late in Taiwan. And thank you so much for your time and availability. We do appreciate. So our first speaker of the day is Professor Garbaudo, followed by my talk. And our last speaker will be Professor Ming Shouhu. And after these three interactions, Q&A session, we will have around 10 to 15 minutes to our uh, lecture. Now I introduce myself. I'm a professor at the Institute of Political Science at UNB, Federal Capital University, and I am very interested in collective action, social movements, and more recently, throughout the past eight or nine years, I am studying digital activism and anything related to it. Having said that, now I would like to hand over to Professor Garbaldo, who will speak in English, and the translation will be available now into Portuguese. Feel free to submit your questions during the presentations. Professor Garbaldo, you have the floor, or better, you have uh, the screen. Thank you. Professor, you should uh, open your mic, please. Muito uh, obrigado pelo convite. Muito obrigado uh, a todos. Eh, Disculpado por retraso. Tive, uh, Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm sorry that I was late. I had technical issues. I'm, I'm really delighted to uh, be able to speak here and share some ideas with you. And I really appreciate the, the great work people are doing in Brazil. And in Brazil, there is a very kind of fertile debate going on on these issues for a very long time. And I think it's really kind of a point of reference internationally uh, when it comes both to questions of activism, online activism, activism on the internet, but also reflections on uh, alternative ways of managing the infrastructure. Right, of managing the internet in ways that are conducive to democratic and political ends. Right? Uh, at least that was the case, say, until before uh, the, the current political situation. Uh, but, but I think it's a very important sign also in terms of what it means uh, for the internet to be a really uh, diverse and, and uh, plural space where different political views, but also different geographic sensibilities different geographic centers, different geographic areas, uh, Latin America and, and Brazil have their own view of the internet, right? Have their own uh, specific take on the internet and the politics of the internet and what that means. So for me, when uh, I was invited to speak at, at this uh, uh, seminar, I mean, the immediate 
um, core that was struck is in a way a very long-standing one is a very long-standing debate about the internet and democracy how do the internet and democracy relate to one another is it true that the internet makes for a more democratic space than old media traditional media whatever you want to call them is it really the case that in a way it is a more free space of ex expression where people from different uh, uh, backgrounds from different worldviews can find their own speaker's corner and express themselves I mean, these questions are questions that have been aired for quite some time, right? I mean, I think I'm old enough uh, to remember the kind of the beginning of these debates, right? Uh, back in the 90s, when the internet first became popularized uh, through the World Wide Web, through the first browsers, and people uh, outside of the small technical circles, right, of information uh, analysts, programmers, technicians, started using the internet for different purposes, uh, including people like academics, uh, artists, activists. And these were the first people, I mean, in the mid to late 90s that were using these things beyond the, say, strict technical sphere. And they were also starting to use them for political purposes, right, to protest. I mean, for example, I remember one of the first online protests that I, uh, ever members of was this net strike against the uh, uh, Chirac government in France at the time of the Mururoa experiments, uh, oh, uh, sorry, the Mururoa nuclear tests, right, in the, in the late 90s. Some of you uh, will remember that, right? And ever since then, uh, there was always this question lingering on, right? I mean, what is happening to politics because of the internet? I think that a really important turning point was quite obviously the anti-globalization movement, right? The anti-globalization protests around the turn of the millennium against the World Trade Organization, against the World Bank, against the International Monetary Fund, uh, the big protest in Genoa. The, and this year is uh, 19 years since Genoa. And I was kind of young, uh, I'm old enough to have been in Genoa when I was younger, right? And it's quite, when you realize it's almost 20 years since then, I mean, you really start thinking that it is almost time to make a history of that, right? It is not anymore a sociology of the internet politics and internet activism. It is in a way about time to, to develop an history of that, namely to be able to look at things with a long durée perspective, with lo long-term perspective, in order to understand, uh, I think fundamentally, what were the promises, and what were uh, the actual results? To what extent have the promises of democratization of the internet that were already there embryonically in the late 90s and early noughties, how, to what extent have they been fulfilled? To what extent was that narrative of a cyber democracy, of a digital democracy, of a more participatory space, uh, uh, to what extent has it been realized? And I think if we do this kind of assessment now in 2020, uh, I think many people will be infused with a rather more pessimistic uh, perspective than probably was the case uh, back then, right? That probably was the case in the raging 90s, uh, in the over-optimistic 90s, where despite grunge and nirvana and their kind of sour tones, many people were very kind of... Uh, uh, self-confident about the progress, technological progress, social progress, and democratic progress. Or also the notice, right, before the big crisis started striking, changing in a way our expectations about the world and our expectations about uh, development, about the possibilities for, say, for, um, uh, for development and for innovation and for a sense of uh, welfare for the majority of the people. Why is it more pessimistic? I mean, it is more pessimistic first and foremost. I mean, not much for COVID-19 uh, in a sense that, I mean, partly is also because I, also I, in amidst COVID-19, we are seeing a phenomenon that predates, in fact, COVID-19. I'm talking about things such as fake news, obviously, misinformation, online misinformation, that then can be cataloged in many different ways. I mean, there are different types of that. Uh, for example, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, misinformation in the form of memes, in the form of online videos that are uh, telling people 
lies fundamentally about COVID, about coronavirus, and about what is happening, used by different political groups, most notably by the alt-right, right, in order to spread a sense of suspicion in the population, a sense of uh, uh, resentment at intellectuals, experts, and scientists, right, and to, in so doing, in a way, um, fuel, cultivate a popular sense of indignation at the elites, mainly seen in this case as fundamentally academics, experts, scientists, researchers, and so on and so forth. Right? I mean, I think this has been perhaps the dominant thread in the last four to five years, right? I mean, the big debate in internet studies and in digital politics studies has been about fake news. It's been about fake news, the effect of online misinformation, and uh, leading some people to say that fundamentally the internet is not a force for democracy, but is a force for authoritarianism, right? I mean, there's many people, many scholars, for example, who have come to assume that in a way there is almost how would you say there is an elective affinity between the internet and populism, but more specifically between the internet and right-wing populism. I mean, the kind of politics uh, peddled by the likes of Donald Trump, uh, Jair Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil, or Matteo Salvini in Italy, and this kind of uh, uh, propaganda that is constantly aimed at instilling fear in people. I mean, there is this perception that the internet is very conducive to that. And that therefore, uh, far from being a friend of democracy, actually the internet has turned into its enemy. I mean, you can read books such as People, People versus Tech uh, by authors close to the Demos Group in, in, in Britain, especially by liberal thinkers. I mean, many liberal thinkers tend to have this very, very pessimistic view of the internet and its effect on politics. Uh, and according to this view, ultimately, the internet and social media in particular tends to fuel, uh, in a way, superstition. Mm, charlatans who are telling us lies and false stories and so on and so forth. And in so doing, it is poisoning public debate that is becoming ever more toxic as an effect not only of fake news and misinformation, but also of the online aggressivity that we see every day. I mean, trolling, right flaming, uh, people insulting each other, people unfriending each other. I mean, last time I was in Brazil for an extended time was in 2014, around the time of the presidential elections uh, between Dima Rousseff and Anesio Neves. And I remember uh, the big fights I was seeing on the Brazilian Facebook back in those days. And I was also interviewing people, and one of the recurrent stories was of relatives, I mean, was of sisters and brothers who had been unfriending each other once they had realized that their uh, relatives were in the opposite uh, political camp and basically took it as something completely intolerable, something they couldn't deal with, right? So that is one example of that. I mean, one example of a uh, public sphere becoming more toxic as it becomes more polarized, right? There are also people who basically are saying that the internet and social media are contributing to a polarization of the public sphere. That is, while in the neoliberal era, you had the center left and the center right were more or less on par on many issues and could find a compromise. Now we go back to kind of a hard left and a hard right and it's often blamed on the internet, on echo chambers, for example, on filter bubbles, on the tendency to reinforce identities. Yeah. So this is basically, to summarize, this is the negative diag uh, diagnosis we have at the moment, right? Basically, the internet as a fiend of democracy and the internet as an ally, fundamentally, of right-wing authoritarianism. My own perspective is that this view is wrong. I mean, this view is wrong not because all these things don't exist. I mean, obviously fake news exists, online misinformation exists. Online polarization as a consequence of equal chambers exists. All these things exist. But if we focus on this negative aspect of the effect of the internet on democracy, 
we end up overlooking uh, the major positive changes that I think social media have brought to our democracy. And more importantly, we risk uh, overlooking the potential, the kind of long-term potential for uh, citizenship, for political capacity building, for political education. I think this is a kind of crucial uh, term uh, that needs to be taken into account. That social media as, as a political arena, as an arena for political discussion, debate, and mobilization. So where do these political potentials or these uh, political positive aspects of social media lie? They lie in the fact that uh, social media have created a truly mass, yet at the same time interactive public sphere, where perhaps for the first time in human history, the mass, the masses are writing in public. The masses are writing in public. What do I mean by that? By that, I mean that the subaltern classes, the popular classes, say ordinary people and the poor, um, throughout history, didn't engage with the medium of writing except for personal communication, right? I mean, to send a letter to the mom when one was forced to migrate abroad or to the loved one or to parents or to sisters. You see what I mean, right? I mean, the medium of writing for the subaltern classes was marginalized exclusively to private functions of communication. In this day and age, if you open your Facebook timeline, you see that many of the people who are writing, commenting, and posting are people who have never written in public before and who have very rarely expressed themselves in public before. Right? People who have never taken a political stance in public. Why is that? Because, say, before the internet, before digital media, it was very difficult, expensive, and intimidating for a person not coming from the middle class or the upper middle class to stand in for the public, be it virtual or real, and express himself herself. Now there is this potential for a mass public in which ordinary people express themselves. Now, often these people express themselves in ways that are that may appear and sometimes are vulgar full of typos and mistakes, full of um, contents that are sometimes wrong, superstitious or misinformed, right? But this is in a way a representation of what society is, correct? I mean, in our society, levels of education vary, levels of expertise vary, levels of grammatical correctness vary. There are different levels and therefore actually, seeing people from the popular classes, from the working class, from the poor, who are engaging with the medium of writing, trying to express their opinion, I think is something that is, uh, for me at least, is exhilarating. In a, in a sense of is inspiring, is something inspiring. Because you see that people uh, often uh, come to that with a very, um, I mean, very unprepared. I mean, some of them are indeed bar bordering on uh, what today is called functional illiteracy, namely people who had schooling, but would never basically use writing. Therefore, when they write, you see that they are not used to writing. Yeah? And some of these people obviously also are more uh, conservative, authoritarian, right-wing views. Yeah? But to me, the real potential there is precisely the fact that by engaging uh, with the medium of writing, these people can go through a learning curve. They can uh, undergo a process of self-education, of self-political education that can make them better citizens. I mean, now perhaps this may sound too optimistic, right? But I think there's been many cases in which this has demonst been demonstrated to be the case. Uh, in the sense that one has to have, I think, some level of... Uh, of belief and, and, and good expectations in people's actual potential for self-improvement, 
for uh, their capacity to discern really real news from fake news, right? And I've really seen some people in many Facebook groups or Twitter timelines come progressively uh, to, to the realization, right? That um, what constitutes a good news, what constitutes a fake news. And therefore, I mean, just to conclude, I'd say that we should uh, see this political potential for self-education, self-improvement, and, and building of a better citizenship as something that is has more weight than the risks for democracy that are inherent in the internet and social media as a public sphere. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Guiribaldo, for this great presentation. I will give myself the floor now for my uh, presentation. And actually it's interesting because it will, uh, I think, give some examples uh, on this optimistic approach to, to the internet that Professor Ribaldo was talking about. Let me share my PowerPoint presentation. I hope everybody is able to, to see it. Okay, good. Digital activism is on the rise. We have heard that claim a lot in the past few years and especially in the past few months associated to the pandemic. Or is it? Um, the goal of my presentation is to discuss this claim. Um, if I can, oh, it's not, sorry, just a second, have a, trying to make the presentation. Let me try something else because it's not working. Technical problems always happen. Let me try again. Let me do it this way and see if can. Mm. Here, there we go. Sorry about that. So bear with me just one moment so I can give you the concept. What do I mean by digital activism? And I propose uh, a broad definition of digital activism as the proactive promotion of political and contentious goals in a specific context through digital technologies. If we use this concept of digital activism, digital activism indeed has been on the rise, but it has been on the rise for the past 30 years. And I think we, it's important to put this in a historical perspective. You can see there the picture of the Zapatistas because I think perhaps they launched the first online global solidarity campaign in the beginning to the mid 1990s in, in Latin America from uh, Mexico, uh, of course. So if this is not a new phenomenon, is anything changing in the context of the pandemic? And are new trends um, sustainable in a post-pandemic uh, world? These are the two questions that I would like to try to answer, or at least organize my presentation around tentative answers to these questions, because of course we're talking about something that is ongoing, it's happening right now, and it's always very risky to talk about the present and much more so to talk about the future. So my tentative answers are affirmative. Yes, um, and uh, yes, there are new trends, and yes, I think they will be um, sustainable in a post-pandemic world, but context matters. It doesn't mean that it is true for everybody everywhere. So I'm going to talk about a specific context and about a specific field of civil society uh, actors. So my argument is that changes in digital activism, the rise in, in digital activism is more visible in context in which the pandemic is not only a long lasting health and economic crisis, but it's also a political one. So in Latin America, I am thinking of countries such as Mexico, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Bolivia, Chile, and of course, Brazil, the case I, I, I know uh, best. But think for instance, that before the pandemic, uh, 
a lot of these countries were already in turmoil. Think about the protests in Chile in the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. The pandemic sort of interrupts this um, protest, but uh, the high levels of dissatisfaction with democracy, high levels of political polarization mean that when the pandemic comes, it comes together with a political crisis. What does have to what does that have to do with um, digital activism? Well, um, everything, because in those countries, because it is a health crisis with an economic and a political crisis, it is long lasting, it is um, more profound and people depend more, rely more on digital tools for uh, activism. Second caveat that I think really important is that, of course, civil society is internally heterogeneous. I'm not going to talk about the whole of civil society in this presentation. My focus will be on sectors that in these specific political contexts face a double challenge. They must both fill in for an, a state that is not there, either because it's unwilling or because it can't. And also they face the challenge um, of being a counter voice to disinformation campaigns in this context. For these civil society organizations in this specific context, digital activism has been used to pursue a wide variety of uh, goals from raising awareness, political education as Professor Gerbaldo was uh, mentioning to mobilizing donors, something that has been crucial and using digital tools to do so, to mobilizing the state, gathering information and offering emotional support. I do not have the time to go through all of these and to give examples of all of these, but if you're interested, uh, our research group has a repository of social, civil society initiatives against the pandemic. You can see the link to the repository here uh, in the bottom of the of the slide, um, the information is basically about Brazil, but about other countries as well, mostly in Portuguese, but some things we also have in, in English. So please go there if you're interested. Um, in this presentation, I want to focus on um, an argument that we can see three trends in digital activism, which I called intensification, expansion, and integration and that these have wide ranging um, impacts on um, the potential use of uh, the internet, the positive potential use of the internet for uh, democracy. The first one, intensification. This um, sounds obvious, but I think it is really uh, important and not uh, actually obvious at all that many more actors are using more digital tools than, than before. Because it's simply not true that everybody already used the, the internet. Even though we had 30 years of digital activism, it has always been an unequal, an uneven uh, process of appropriation of digital tools. And we have literature, you know, we have research that shows how this is, is true and how resources matter. In the context of the pandemic, resources still matter and that's something that is worrisome in, in a context of posit a positive empowerment of more actors, a digital empowerment of more uh, actors, um, the most vulnerable communities uh, get less attention on online. So that is uh, uh, a problem. Um, I have been thinking in terms of a, a a kind of social media bias. So uh, a lot of the uh, civil society organizations that are going online to debate and raise awareness about the pandemic, most of them you know, have a Facebook page, have a Facebook group or a Twitter account, but very few of them have uh, a, a broader um, approach to, to digital activism. Few of them have uh, a good website. Few of them have uh, an app um, for users to donate uh, resources, which, as I said, is, of course, one of the key activities of these uh, civil society organizations. Professor Glaser mentioned 
the bracket those apps and I put it here as an example of uh, new actors doing new things uh, online. This is from the second day of strike called by the app delivery workers. And one interesting thing is that they uh, do what in social movement literature is called frame uh, bridging. They are linking in their campaign, they're linking their demands for a better working condition, conditions to, of course, the pandemic, um, asking for uh, protection equipment and so on, but they're also linking it to the pro-democracy movement in Brazil and the anti-fascist movement, which is actually transnational. It's not only, only Brazilian. Uh, this is a sector that we had not seen mobilized so much and so efficiently in the past. And I think there are several reasons for this, but uh, anyway, the, the pandemic for this sector of civil society um, provides uh, an opportunity to, to launch this kind of uh, campaign. They have become very, very visible. In terms of uh, expansion, what do I mean by that? Expansion of digital repertoires, uh, it refers to uh, the expansion of the set of tools and strategies used by actors for digital activism. So we have seen digital marches, digital flash mobs, hashtag campaigns, which are of course not new, but they're done in new ways by uh, actors that did not do them before as part of a continuous process of innovation in digital uh, activist uh, practices. However, and there's a however or a but in each of these uh, things, this does not mean that um, digital activism substitute offline activism or that more specifically digital protests do not substitute offline protests. In fact, the data we have for the past months in, in Latin America uh, show that both are uh, increasing. One example that uh, I like from about this, um, the new repertoires and expansion of repertoires is actually not about protests, but it comes from media activist collectives, which have been active for uh, a long time, for instance, in, in Brazilian uh, slums, and then have taken uh, a very important role in raising awareness and in translating the more scientific um, medical kind of vocabulary to um, a vocabulary of the uh, poorest communities in, in Brazil. Here you see in the slide um, a print screen of uh, the smartphone app that the organization Communities Voice created in Rio that's specifically to be able to share information about the pandemic. And on the right, the picture of a podcast that has actually seen the, they have 40 editions of this podcast that was created by um, another media activist uh, agency, again, with the same goal of uh, sharing information, um, of course, sharing true information, scientific information about the, the pandemic. Finally, the last trend I would like to point out to you is um, a better integration by these activists, or at least an attempt to better integrate online and offline tools in the context of the, of the pandemic. So we see uh, these uh, podcasts, we see a lot of lives, we see uh, community radios that are at the same time streaming on Facebook and on uh, Twitter, but at the same time, you know, the typical ways of communication of the past are still on, so they still, you know, um, share uh, leaflets or they, they still, you know, door to door kind of uh, communication is still, is still relevant. One thing in terms of a research uh, hypothesis that I have been uh, seeing is that in the context of protests, digital tools are changing. They're not used, are being used not only to support offline protests such as, you know, um, before the protest, make a Facebook event page, uh, 
um, create a, a hashtag and so on, but they are themselves constitutive, these digital tools constitutives of the events. I think there is more of a blurring of the lines that um, separate online and offline protests. And the example I want to, to show you uh, comes actually from Mexico, not from Brazil. In May, Traditionally, the Mother's Day is celebrated in Mexico with a street protest of human rights organizations and organizations that bring together mothers of the disappeared, which are tens of thousands of people disappeared in Mexico. This is a very important social movement in, in Mexico. This May, they did have the street protests, but they also had this for the first time, a digital march. As you can see in this picture, people took to the social medias to, with their pictures, wearing a mask, saying, don't stand, where are they? So um, again, um, relating the, the pandemic, the health issues with, um, in this case, the issue of the disappeared and human rights struggles in, in Mexico. So to, to conclude, um, and then uh, hopefully we'll have uh, time to discuss more some of these uh, trends in, in the Q&A. Um, as I said before, I think that these trends are overall in this context and for this specific civil society sector uh, have a, a, a very positive potential in terms of democratic change. What are a couple of challenges that I see with respect to this potential. One is the issue of digital asymmetries within civil society. And I think it's really important that we also talk about power digital asymmetries within civil society, within this uh, field of um, civil society uh, organizations, we see a lot of uh, differences, a lot of power asymmetries. And I think this is an important issue because um, less powerful communities have less digital influence. And the second challenge, uh, which is related to this uh, first one, is how do you generate new modes of coordination among this? It's literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, initiatives. We have seen some new things here, some new coalitions being built and some new you know, ties among uh, organizations that are being built, but this is, I think, is still uh, a very important organizational challenge and something that can um, increase much more the influence of this, of this actor. So uh, to conclude, I think that the trends I mentioned have wide ranging uh, potential implications for democracy because they imply a reorganization of civil society and of uh, activism with a centrality of digital tools that digital tools did not have before. Thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my screen now and give the floor to Ming Shou Hu for his presentation. As I mentioned before, Ming Shou Hu is a sociologist and a professor at National Taiwan University. Thank you for being here. We know it's late in Taiwan and we know you're on vacation. So we are very grateful for having you here. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, so let me share my screen. Um, so today I'm going to share with you my observation with what happened in Hong Kong which was stop a uh, water revolution for certain reason. So what I'm going to do here is to briefly introduce what happened for the past, past one year. And then I will go into the law of the internet um, and then both on a both positive and negative side. So, and I will conclude my, my presentation. And I know that I have less than 15 minutes, so I will be very quick. Um, so a few, uh, introduction here. Uh, so what happened last year in Hong Kong? Uh, uh, the thing is that uh, it also it always it started with an extradition bill that was proposed by the government, and the bill will allow fugitive to be transferred to the mainland, so mainland uh, judicial authority, and so people got really afraid. That, uh, even though Hong Kong has been a special administration zone for 
uh, in China for more than 20 years, but people were guaranteed with high degree of self uh, autonomy, including that people should not be trialed. People in Hong Kong should not be trialed in mainland court. And knowing that all the communist courts are very problematic. So, and the problem, uh, the, uh, the, the, so the movement really gets started over the, the bill. And, and, and even though the bill was withdrawn in September, but the movement kept going on and the project surged in June. And at that time, there was a 2 million demonstration and, and uh, Hong Kong has actually less than 8 million. So you, you imagine the, the, the scale of it. And the, the, I would say the protest uh, dynamic peaked in last November and then it become more subdued, but still shimmer, uh, shimmering right now. And in the past, we all only see uh, protesters in Hong Kong uh, using very peaceful means. But this time we see very violent uh, means like they uh, threw uh, fire bombs and they uh, do exercise some vigilant vigilantism, meaning that they use physical violence against mobster uh, hired by uh, for government politician, and also they, they destroy the stores operated by China, China's enterprises or by pro-China uh, companies. And um, but even though uh, the the, pub, the movement is popularly popularly supported, so there was an election last year, and and the the, the, the pro-democracy Cam win a big landslide. Um, so, as I said, uh, the, the protests become more subdued uh, uh, after uh, after the election in November, and uh, with the eruption of COVID nineteen in January it's still going on. And so far, it's been more than one year, and we know more than 9,000 9, people have been arrested, and nearly two thousand have been persecuted, and around one hundred plus have been sentenced and sent to jail. And throughout the whole process, and more than ten people have been killed for a lot, a lot of reasons. Some people uh, just uh, commit suicide for protest, and some of the people just found dead. And people suspected that was a result of a police riot violence. And more than ten thousand people taking refugee overseas. And we all know that uh, effective beginning this month, there's a new national security law. So basically, Hong Kong is put under martial law right now. And we know it, that's the real spell the end of a so-called one country, two system. So it's from now on, from this month on, actually it's a direct rule from Beijing. And it has become a, a, a new flashpoint for the emerging Cold War. And we don't know how it will play out in the end. So let me go, go, uh, go, uh, go, go, go to the question, why it was called Water Revolution? Because uh, one, of the, one of the slogans in the movement was to be water. And that actually was a quote from a locally produced famous martial art, uh, Bruce Lee. And he got a, your, his own philosophy of, of practicing Kung Fu, meaning that you have to be flexible, adaptive, just like water. So that the kind of uh, uh, meaning had catch on. So in order to understand the novelty of the project starting last year, we have to know a little bit about history because uh, in Hong Kong five years ago, there was a so-called umbrella movement and it was an occupied protest. And for 79 days, uh, three zones of occupation have emerged. And, but in the end, it just collapsed out of the energy. And there was a student leadership at that time. So it was not a, a, a so-called uh, 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 a leaderless movement. But at that time, a student was perceived as ineffective. So a lot of reflection had been taking place. So uh, when the protest erupted, erupted last year, so there are a lot of uh, way to characterize the movement and a lot of uh, saying at that time and people all know that. And so like, for example, no main stage because at that time, uh, four, five years ago, there was a main stage. So uh, and people were really not satisfied about uh, the protest. So main stage become a shorthand for, for, for uh, for leadership, so the so no main state. And the second uh, uh, slogan of saying uh, is a brother climb mountain, each has to make effort, meaning that everyone has to make their own, his or her their own decision and think what is the best contribution to the movement. So you have to decide for, for yourself. And also the last one is no separation of the peaceful and the militant, because in the past only people Hong Kong only exercised peaceful protest, but it did not work. And that's why, so that's why it, it become the movement evolved into more violent 
uh, manifestation. Um, and these are the examples of the uh, protest forms that emerged last year. So the button left is a uh, rally in the airport because people know that if you gather in the airport, uh, you have the power to disrupt the air, air traffic. And also police will not use tear gas in, in a place where a, a lot of international visitors are. And the, uh, the button left is, uh, no, the button left is a human chain rally. So they use that, it's a very peaceful, it's, they learn that from Baltic countries. And, uh, uh, and the upper right is thinning in the shopping mall uh, because it, it's, it kind of, uh, it's kind of a symbol for resistance. And if you've been to Hong Kong, you know that there are a lot of shopping mall and they're all connected to certain metro station. So it becomes a very convenient place for people to get around and sing a song. And the, and the, right, uh, the bottom right is the, the so-called so, so uh, lunch with you. It took place usually in the financial center uh, during the lunch hour, lunch break. So you see these people, these are mostly like middle class professional uh, involving uh, working for financial sectors. And they took their lunch hour for protest just for one hour. And this, these tactics are all initiated in, on the internet. So there was, there was not any organization responsible for that. And I want to mention a special internet forum that was become very important last year. It was called LI, LIHKG. It was like a ready like a decision, a discussion forum. Um, in order to assess, uh, to to uh, assess this uh, forum, you have to have a Hong Kong registered account. So, so by by that rule, you actually uh, you exclude people uh, who are based in mainland China. And so there are a lot of discussion here. Um, so in, in the first few months, it was very good at decision making. So let me give you just one example in, a, in, a, in this Chinese here, but I want to translate that. Like in the early September, the government finally withdrew the bill. So there was a discussion that whether we should continue the movement or not. So there was a people post that, post the question there, should we continue? And until we meet all our demand, or should we stop here? And so there was a discussion and people can vote. So you see that uh, around 12,000 uh, users said, no, we should, we should not stop here, we should continue. And this thing, 100 or 200, people say, yes, we should stop. So this is a kind of an example of how people really got involved in this discussion forum. And this is another example because uh, there was a big rally in August 18, uh, which attracted 1.7 million people there and so a lot of uh, visual artists, uh, illustrators, uh, comic drawers, uh, professionals, or amateurs, they become to submit their poster works. Uh, uh, so a lot of uh, and they submit the poster works in a special channel in a Telegram, so people can just download this uh, poster and print it out and paste it in their neighborhood walls, and so that people would know that oh there was an event there. And also, I want to mention that uh, we see a lot of street confrontation, but behind that, actually, there was, a, I would say, an underground city, uh, an invisible city of logistic network. So, so these people, these protesters can uh, satisfy their needs, and, and if they need, uh, if they want it, and through this on official channel, like if they want, you can uh, uh, seek medical care because a lot of protests that don't want to go to the hospitals because they will be reported by, by, by doctors or nurses there. And also uh, there are some stores who donate a lot of resources for the movement. So you can patronize these stores and, and then they can earn profit and some of the profit will come to become a resources for the movement. Or some of the protesters was uh, dismissed because of their particip participation. So you can, Help them to find a job. So these are spread out in different internet platforms. So you can say there's an invisible city there. But I want to say that uh, internet re are really important. But but in the Hong Kong case, we see that it is not a panacea to solve all the problems. Like for example, in the frontline activists, when they these people were doing some combat with a policeman, uh, they always form a small groups called squads, and most of these members who come came from who came from this 
uh, uh, the same, uh, 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 they came from old acquaintances. Either they were friends, classmates, or co-workers. None of them uh, will accept new members because it's high risk. And people, a lot of, uh, they know that police have used internet uh, to penetrate these frontline warriors, so they don't accept uh, new members. And when they were uh, confronting the police, they have really no time to check the internet. So they really have to rely on the trust that was formed before the involvement of the protest. And also on the logistics side, logistics side um, a lot of people doing some donation, um, but they, when they want to give some, some material to the people who need it, they always use delivery service instead because they don't want to have uh, human to human contacts. So most of the people get to know other people through friends or friends. So internet is really not a place where you can know other people because it's knowing that a lot of uh, uh, information can be compromised. And also, also the, I think the government become, over the year become more uh, sophisticated in using internet for repression. So in Hong Kong, there was a talk about white terrors because like say airlines or school teachers may be dismissed or sanctioned because they because of their posts in social media like Facebook. So this become a kind of a, a lot of, create a lot of fear among these people. And also people, when people were arrested, the first thing police would do is to force the arrested to unlock their phone. So they can, they can assess a, a, a way wealth of information. And so I know some of Hong Kong have been detained at the border to China and they didn't do anything, but how do the Chinese officials knew that they were involved in the movement? So you see a lot of leak of information there. And also, uh, I want to highlight that uh, five years ago in during the umbrella movement, I think internet will probably be a, a weapon for the protest. So that would be a, a no, a no, a no brainer. And, and know that I, uh, the government really does, does not have a resources to combat uh, how the protests were using this internet resources. But over a year, I've seen the, the government become smarter because they start their own disinformation campaign. So a lot of in online platforms like WeChat, Weibo, and TikTok, all these are Chinese operated. And they spread a lot of falsehoods about the movement. And as far as I know, a lot of my, my, mainland migrants in Hong Kong or ethnic Chinese in South Asia, and also Chinese migrants in the West are so reliant on this media. So the, the information they, they receive about Hong Kong are totally wrong. And also even Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube had removed some accounts uh, last year because they were uh, involved with spreading the false information about Hong Kong. So, um, so the conclusion is that um, I, I, the, what happened in last year and until now, the, the Hong Kong's water revolution is more decentralized, decentralized. So a more they allowing more more freedom for for internet uh, based uh, political action, and the decision is more inclusive, democratic, and sometimes more effective. I would say, but I'm afraid that the internet can be overly or easily. Uh, overrated because on offline trust is very important and also the regime the so-called digital learning is and i think there's a learning curve of that and um, uh, dictator have, dictators have become uh, smarter and over the year and the cyber information campaign is something really uh, a, a, a big trouble for protesters so i will start my presentation here and thank you very much Thank you so much, Mingxiu. It's a really fascinating case and having the opportunity to hear from you is really amazing, an amazing opportunity to hear more about this important case of which we, we know very little. And it's quite uh, interesting also because a lot of the things you said um, I found there are many similarities with the Chilean student movement that I studied years ago on the issue of leadership, on the issue of trust, on the issue of the government using uh, the, the internet and the types of challenges this poses for student movement uh, leaders. 
So uh, anyway, fascinating. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions and not so much time, but we can, I think, have uh, two rounds. Let me begin by selecting a few of the questions for this first uh, round. They're really, really very good questions and some of them are very hard as well. Um, I will start with sort of more general questions for everybody and then maybe we can, if we have time, we can try and answer the more specific ones or I can send them to you, of course, as, as well. Um, some questions are related to the changes being brought by the pandemic. Maybe we can start with uh, that. I am personally curious to know whether the trends uh, I mentioned and that uh, I see at least in the context of Brazil and of other countries in Latin America, whether you see those trends as well in your specific context and how the pandemic has affected the, the movement in, in Hong Kong also would be very interesting to hear about that. And someone also on the pandemic, someone is asking whether we know about experiences of digital activism that contribute to build solutions against the pandemic. Um, so I think we can uh, maybe begin with uh, those and then we'll do another round. Um, Professor Gerbaldo, would you like to answer? Yes, so um, because I, I was seeing also other questions uh, that were directed to me specifically, should I start with those or with this more general discussion about the pandemic? And uh, Let's start with the more general discussion about the pandemic, but then feel free to also address other questions if you, if you want. Yes, I mean, I'd say my, my first point would be that, I mean, many of the tendencies that we're seeing now during the pandemic are not actually all that new. They are, in a way, an exacerbation of tendencies that were already extant uh, before uh, the COVID pandemic uh, began. In particular, this conflict about around science, right, that has become very prominent. Uh, for example, uh, most notably, the Novax movement, for example, anti-vaccination movement, the free vax movement, uh, as they call themselves more endearingly, basically free vax is just a euphemism for no vax. So basically activists that are questioning whether vaccinations are a good thing or activists that are questioning whether the pandemic exists at all. I mean, I think we've seen quite a bit of that, I mean, on the internet in coming uh, um, days, weeks, and months now, because uh, it's already several months we are in this situation. I think that this raises a very fascinating question, not just about the internet, but, but about the nature of knowledge in our society. And the fact that we live in a society in which we need to accept a lot of scientific knowledge that is not immediately understandable for anyone except for a PhD in virology. Right. I mean, even for many people in this room, I mean, in this room, all people have PhDs. Right. Uh, but perhaps we have them in informatics or we have them in sociology or political science. There is a degree of specialization in our world that is quite incredible, which means that to a certain extent, uh, in order to accept this knowledge, scientific knowledge, there is a, an act of uh, uh, just one second. <laughs> Uh, that's my nephew who came into the room. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that is a, an act almost of faith, a leap of faith, uh, a leap of belief, of realization, of belief in uh, uh, the fact that the, the scientists are telling us a good thing. Good things, right? So this opens leeways, this opens uh, opportunities for uh, uh, people, for deniers and doubters, right? The question is how, what is the best way to react to that? I think there is one way that is rather kind of authoritarian and rather, um, I would say, just asserting, basically science is like that, shut up, right? The problem is that from a democratic public spirit perspective, it doesn't always work, right? In a sense that sometimes it reinforces the anti-authoritarianism that is actually quite prominent on the internet, 
right? In this distrust of authority, no matter what, there is almost a sort of inherent character of, of uh, digital culture, right? The fact that people uh, are suspicious, right, of mainstream news media, of scientific authority, of institution, of political authority, and, and so on and so forth. So the matter there is how, what is the best approach, right? I mean, is how to find an engaging approach where you basically explain again and again to people who are not expert in a certain area, how things are, right? Uh, so that connects a bit with the argument I, I made before uh, that, you know, we need to realize the political education potential of the internet. But to do that, we need to go down to the average level of education and understanding of the people. We cannot start from here and say you need to come here. We need to go down to the average and say, all right, you know, lift progressively people's awareness, education, and expertise up by accepting dialogue and criticism, even when it sounds ridiculous, right? But I think that is the kind of right approach. Thank you. Ming Shou? Yes. Uh, so the question was, is about COVID-19 and a movement. Yeah, in the case of the Hong Kong, I would say uh, before the eruption of the pandemic in late January, in late uh, January, I think the movement was a little bit uh, declined because so, because so many people have been arrested. And so there are fewer and fewer people who are willing to to, to the street. But still, the, the anger was there, and there are a lot of people who were still doing the peaceful demonstration. But what happened is that uh, with the eruption of the pandemic, the government announced a ban uh, on over any any gathering over four people is not allowed. Uh, so even like some of the mild peaceful protests, from like sitting in a gathering and sitting in a in a in a shopping mall was not allowed. And what happened? Afterwards, that the government took use of this opportunity and uh, promote, promote, the, uh, promote promote a lot of measure that is very restrictive and repressive, and arrest a lot of people. And what happened in, in late May was that the, the Beijing announced a new security law, and that wasn't effective uh, this gen this 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 month earlier this month. So basically, the government is take over, took over the advantage of this pandemic crisis and expanding, expanding its authoritarian power. And knowing that the civil society probably does not have the, the 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 strength to resist that, so I would say that the Hong Kong movement was kind of uh, being victimized by the unexpected eruption of the, the health crisis. And I'll stop here. Thank you. On this question about the whether there are experiences of digital activism that contribute to build solutions uh, against the, the pandemic around, around the world, well, I think there are many. Um, but of course, you know, I, I don't know about building solutions to the pandemic because that's very broad and complicated and, and maybe only with a, a vaccine we'll be able to do that. But um, that list of goals that I showed in the beginning of the presentation, I think all of them are uh, good examples. So a lot of the things that are being done, what uh, Paul Gerbaldo mentioned in terms of political education and raising awareness, that is a, a, a real challenge um, that a lot of civil society organizations have faced because, of course, uh, talking about social isolation, distancing, um, not going to work, no, doing home office, um, talking about these kinds of things in, in a context of chronic inequality in Latin America, it, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to tell people that they have to do this when, uh, in fact, they have to keep going to, to work. So um, I think there are many, many initiatives that are related to, to that, to raising awareness and to uh, finding new ways of discussing um, solutions to the pandemic that are adapted 
to the, the context of chronic inequality in, in Latin America that are really, really uh, interesting. But besides that, there are many, many other things. There are websites that help connect donors with those uh, that need uh, donations, that help connect people who have uh, masks or medical equipment and uh, connect them with uh, doctors. And then there are simply websites that um, provide maps of these initiatives and provide context of initiatives uh, in the Brazilian case all over the country, I'm sure in other places as well. So yes, there are many, many examples with, in the repository we have, we're trying to have a, a systematic list of, of that, but that's an ongoing research challenge, I think. So, okay, there are many, many other questions. There are um, some of the questions are related to the key issue of um, inequality. How can we have meaningful participation in such an unequal environment is a, is a great uh, question. Someone talked about the internet as a space of privileges. So um, that's a, a big question for, for the whole for the whole panel. And then you can feel free to, to address more uh, specific questions. Ming Shou, you have two questions about the Hong Kong uh, protests. Uh, one says that protesters in Hong Kong seem to be more tech savvy, trying to mislead state surveillance techniques and suspecting of the internet for its usage as a means of repression by the government. How such techniques compare to what activists in Brazil and elsewhere do. Well, we have to have a research project, right? We, we should have a comparative research project to address this. But maybe you can talk a bit about this tech savvy characteristic of the Hong Kong protesters. Uh, and the, there is another question, how social movement surveillance might occur under circumstances where the state is not the only or main problem. For instance, private companies, data collection, and of course, this in the context of the pandemic. Someone else also asked about this in the context of the pandemic, the issue of data, data privacy. And um, there are also uh, specific questions to Professor Paulo Gerbaldo. How could you capture this more optimistic view of the democratic power of the internet today empirically? What would be the guidelines of such a research? And then um, someone says, I understand that one of the perspectives that seeks to understand about this information identifies in a certain way the cause of this problem in the manipulative character of the masses. This is an elitist perspective. I would like to ask what Professor Gerbaldo thinks about this perspective, especially if he has a critical view of this approach. So uh, Professor Gerbaldo, do you want to address these questions and then Ming you're still muted. Yes. There. Yeah, I am. All right. Uh, let's begin from the question of inequality. I mean, the famous question of the digital divide, right? There was, in a way, a question that was very strong at the beginning, at the outset of internet studies in the 90s and the noughties. Many people were talking about the digital divide. Right. Also, because there was a time when internet connection was quite limited. Uh, I mean, now things obviously have changed in the sense that if in the year 2000, uh, around 10 percent of the world population was connected to the internet, uh, around the year um, 2012, it was around kind of half percent of uh, um, 50 percent of the population, and that is growing. So, per se, the question of connection has become less important than it was, but it is not totally eliminated, even in supposedly developed countries. With the, with the pandemic, with the lockdown, with the distance learning uh, necessity, we came to realize that even in countries such as whatever, the United Kingdom, France, and so on and so forth, there's a sizable number, a small but significant number of the population that basically has no internet access because doesn't, uh, they don't have a laptop computer at home, for example. Now, these inequalities don't have to do just with infrastructure, with access to a computer. They have to do with expertise, with knowledge, right? They have different intensities. I mean, there's people who are able to send an email and people are able to code in PHP and whatever, MySQL. 
these are obviously or uh, people who are graphic designers, right? There is a difference in skills that is quite significant. And then there is a difference that is, I think, is very important when it comes to activism, understanding activism and some problems with activism as well. That is the difference in the availability of time. There are people who have a lot of time. There are people who have very little time. And therefore, this makes participation highly unequal and often not representative of what the population is. In my last, uh, for last book, uh, because now there is a new one coming out on digital parties, I talk about participationism and the dictatorship of people with time. Right? I mean, there are people who, because, for example, they are retired or uh, are doing a job that gives them a lot of flexibility or are university students and have more time than people who are employed and are very busy, or people who don't have family commitments or care commitments to elderly people, these people have plenty of time. What this leads to is that sometimes these people become more vocal than other people that perhaps are more representative of the population, but don't have time enough to express themselves. So I think this is, in a case, always the problem with social movements, whatever the case. Social movements are never flat. They are always bumpy and asymmetrical. But I think this is a question that needs to be taken into account when we look at so-called participatory utopias. So ideas that participation is the solution to everything, right? which is a big component of digital culture, from Wikipedia to many uh, social movements these days. Moving to the other question. So yes, indeed, I think there is an elitist take often on the attitude of the masses in their online participation. There is a tendency, especially by liberal and centrist uh, theorists and politicians, to discount anything people who are not qualified uh, say as something that is not acceptable, that is uh, immediately misinformation, that is immediately uh, vulgar, and so on and so forth. Now, I think that is, this is very dangerous because ultimately this, uh, uh, in a way, antagonizes the people who are the subject of democracy. I mean, these people have the right to vote. So if you antagonize these people, these people are going to vote against you, right? Any political part that is serious about the politics of consensus should instead elevate the people. So the point should not be just giving people what they want and keeping them at the level of education or awareness they are. The question should be lifting them, but lifting them progressively and slowly in a realistic manner, right? If you give people whatever, uh, Lancet articles on the COVID pandemic, and you think you're going to persuade people like that, it's probably not going to work. But perhaps if you give them three slides with summary points from existing research, you may persuade them that COVID is a real issue. Uh, coming to the last question. So how can you prove this question, uh, this optimism about political education uh, uh, in an empirical manner? I think that indeed this is more of a theoretical point or a philosophical point I'm, I'm making now, one that is supported by sociological observations, but uh, to date in a rather unsystem unsystematic manner. And what, what one would need are things such as surveys, larger scale surveys, uh, uh, in depth interviews with internet users. But I think what is really crucial, and few people have studied in detail, is the fine grain of political discussions online. Uh, the very complex turns in uh, discussions when people are commenting, for example, in comments, right? Or below the line uh, areas, so-called, below the line in the sense the comment section, for example, on The Guardian or other websites, and trying to understand what is going on there, what kind of psychological and what kind of social processes are taking place there and whether they are, in a way, they resemble some form of deliberation, whether it, it's only chatter and uh, uh, flame, or there is some form of rationality and collective intelligence emerging there. Right? But I think, indeed, to, to prove this uh, systematically, it would need large-scale empirical investigation, uh, which today is still to be done. Thank you. Ming Shou? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think Hong Kong protesters are very technical. Uh, 
psychological is a technical savvy uh, for a very important reason because the uh, their opponent Chinese government is also very sophisticated using digital knowledge so there is a reason why they have to be uh, aware of the risk so a lot of people I know actually use VPN even even when they were assessing the in internet data within Hong Kong knowing that probably the the, the user ID will be compromised and like uh, they were like for example they they like well, they have many uh, smartphones if they want to install some Chinese uh, um, apps like like uh, TikTok or WeChat they would not use it for other conversation or purpose knowing that it could be a spyware and also by the way zoom is also highly suspected uh, the medium we are use, using right now so I, I assume that hong kong professor no hong kong professor would like to talk about a uh, protest in hong kong in zoom knowing that anything will be stored and probably sent back to beijing so yes they are very risk conscious and knowing that because they were operating in a very uh, dangerous uh, terrain and also uh, sort of the, it's not just against the state and because the, 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 the surveillance is actually could be outsourced to a lot of private companies. So that's what I know that they were savvy at the same time. So they, they were also on, uh, on their uh, high level of alert. And I, I thought also another question about generation. Yes, I think young people are more prone to protest and they have a lot of generational grievances is probably universal. Uh, and also in the case of Hong Kong. And so for the past that past past year, we have actually a lot of narrative that from the older generation, the established one would say that young people do, do not really appreciate that they were so lucky to be born into a wealth, uh, wealthy and well-developed city and they don't cherish anything. And from, on the other hand, the young people will say that the, the, the glorious days of Hong Kong are past and the, 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 the parent generation are probably the last one are going to benefit from it. And the, the, the housing price is ridiculous that uh, any uh, college uh, graduate would never, never able to buy a, a unit apartment uh, with their own salary. So a lot of resentment about age in, in Hong Kong were there. But, but knowing that uh, in the, uh, the movement also tried to produce a counter narrative that, for example, there was a, as I remember, there was a rally organized by senior people. So there was like thousands of uh, gray haired citizens and stood in a rally and said that we, we support our, uh, the young people to protest because they don't want to be, they don't want to, uh, they don't want the case that uh, the generational divide had been play out by the government because the issue, the, the democratization of Hong Kong and also the, the, the extradition is actually a, is involved all citizens in Hong Kong. So here's my response. Thank you. I got a question here about what would be, what could governments and academia do to democratize the internet? That's the million dollar question, right? Um, well, um, of course, there are many things that can um, be done. Um, I think that, uh, let's go back to the issue of uh, inequality. I uh, agree with what uh, Professor Gimbaldo said, the connection uh, is not eliminated as a problem, but it's not, the only problem, and it's crucial to think about how people connect the issue of expertise, also the issue of the quality of the data connection that um, they they have um, related to that. You know, I think it's really important to think about autonomy in digital activism. Mm -hmm. Think about ways in which um, we can decrease the dependency of activists on social media companies for their digital activist practices. And in that regard, I think the Hong Kong experience of innovation in digital activism is really, a really, really interesting one, um, in spite of all the problems that Ming Xiao was uh, mentioning. Uh, for researchers, for the academia, we, we face several challenges. And I think that Paolo was mentioning um, 
was was signaling towards one of the options that we have because because really now it's very hard for us to uh, have access to certain types of data. And this is uh, a hard conversation to have because of privacy issues. So in Brazil, WhatsApp has become so, so relevant, um, but really what kind of access to WhatsApp data do we have to know what is really uh, going on? And uh, so in terms of the academia, I think a, a huge challenge is to find ways to study these processes and maybe Maybe it's more with qualitative uh, methods, which has, have not actually been so used by um, the literature on, on digital activism. And maybe we need to do more. And of course, Professor Gerbaldo is a reference uh, in that. And, and Ming Shou has used, uh, of course, um, qualitative methods as well, then access to big data in contexts in which we do not have good access to big data or to reliable data to say anything really meaningful, for instance, about WhatsApp and, and how people use WhatsApp for politics. But again, this is um, a really complex uh, co uh, issue. I think that um, we have uh, two more um, questions for the whole panel. Maybe I can uh, read them and then um, when you answer, you can also say your last thoughts. It's, um, we have been here almost two hours and it, I know it's really, for me, so it's really late already. And thanks again for, for being here. So I'm going to read this and, and then you can, you know, very briefly uh, answer or say your final, the final words. How, how does the uh, techniques such as deep fake, huh? Another important issue. How can deepfake uh, impact elections, um, elections? And should the big social media firms, um, corporations, uh, guarantee the anonymity of users in democracies? And the second one is what kind of techniques have been developed by activists for algorithmic, algorithmic resistance? to try and, and avoid interference of the platforms that mediate their mobilizations? Well, two <laughs> really important uh, questions here. And uh, I'm sorry if I maybe missed a, a question. I will make sure the panelists uh, get um, a copy of this, of this chat after this uh, is over. So thank you again and Paulo, Yes, so let's start, one second, can you hear me right? Okay, let's start from the general question of what uh, universities and government can do. And I mean, I also saw some people were asking about alternative platforms for, for activists to resist the uh, algorithmic uh, uh, power. I think that it is a very tricky question, right? In a sense that, I mean, it's true that now we are using platforms that we cannot control. Platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, partly also Amazon, right? It's a, it's a platform, though it's not an expression platform. But it, and these companies, uh, these platforms are controlled by the largest capitalist companies in the world, right? So this makes quite a, a contradictory situation, given that uh, the very powers that should be criticized and monitored and kept under control are actually the powers that that control the platforms. At the same time, many attempts have been made in recent years to create alternative platforms and alternative social networks, alternative social media. I'm sure many of us have accounts in alternative social media, and we know how those attempts did not work. It doesn't mean that they will never work. I mean, that we may not have something like Wikipedia that is more kind of civil society, that is known for, prof for profit. Maybe that in the future, we will have something like that. But to date, I think we need to kind of recognize that all these attempts at creating alternative social networks have, have uh, foundered. The risk also in creating dedicated social networks for only for activists that are fair and just is that we ultimately exit the kind of mass space and we move to uh, self, uh, uh, to an invited community, invitational community space, right? 
a space where it's people who are just like us, are just activists, whatever. But in so doing, there is a risk of disconnection with the broader population that is instead still using those platforms. Right? So sometimes all these uh, talking about let's leave Facebook or let's abandon Twitter, I mean, but where to? In a sense, right? I mean, there is a huge cost to that. Uh, so we are caught in, in this catch-22 situation, right? So it's this contradictory situation which is very hard uh, to actually move out uh, because the, the, there's no uh, seeming uh, realistic way out of that. Now, I think that in that way, a sort of pragmatic approach needs to be developed, um, realizing that also capitalist companies have a weakness. They have an Achilles heel in a sense that they have competition from other companies. Uh, they don't want to be seen as censoring companies. They don't want to be seen as companies against freedom of expression. So in a way, there is a sort of tug of war or there is a weird complicity sometimes between activists and platforms. Uh, interestingly, uh, is visible also in, I mean, also in Chinese platforms such as Weibo and others, where uh, there is a sort of tug of war between the company and the, the, the will to show itself as a space of free expression and the state that comes in and says, no, wait a second, your profit and your public come second vis-a-vis -vis the security of the state. So I think for, for activists, the fundamental thing is always working in the fissure, right? Always working in the gaps between countervailing power tendencies, right? Between the state pushing one way, companies pushing the other way, and inserting themselves in those contradictions in order to find spaces uh, to express oneself. Uh, and then progressively, incrementally, indeed, creating new platforms, new technologies, new protocols that may progressively substitute the dominance of the old, right? But one has to have a, a short term, a medium term, and a long term strategy in order to do that. It's not an either or situation, right? Otherwise, it's a suicidal situation. Second point, there comes the question of, of universities. What can universities do? What can education do? I mean, as I expressed at the beginning in my talk, I think there is a huge role for education. Always after big technological revolutions, there is a huge sense of disorientation because people don't have yet the skills, practices, and custom that can match up the new technical situation they're facing. Right? And there is this sense of shock and awe in front of change. But there is precisely the place where educational institutions need to intervene in order A, to provide people with the necessary skills and confidence to engage with this space, right? And B, to allow society to develop customs, etiquettes, rules that can give order to the chaos we see every day on the internet, right? Can basically determine what is right, what is wrong, what is acceptable, what is, what is unacceptable, and provide people with widely recognized practices that can bring things under control, yeah? So I think, in a way, there is no really easy solution, no easy solutionism either uh, out of this, but an awareness uh, of the need, in a way, to play on different tables, as it were, in order to advance uh, democracy on the internet. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Ming Xiao Ho? Uh, yes. Um, well, based in Taiwan, um, our experience is, experience is that um, the authoritarian reach of China, the misinformation campaign, are really a big problem in Taiwan because of, because of a geo uh, political proximity. Um, so, like before the COVID nineteen, we had a lot of uh, influence campaign in, in our elections, and also it, during the COVID nineteen, a lot of falsehood about Taiwan. We don't know it come from China, but it is very difficult to for the government to exercise censorship because it, it always creates more problem than you than they try to solve. So what happened in Taiwan is that there are some NGO or digital activists they create like a, a fact check a fact check center and they try to collaborate with uh, some of the social media platform like Facebook. So they try to verify every information and try to stop some 
uh, disinformation from spreading. I think that's one thing that uh, a civil society activity could do, that they, 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 they collaborate uh, horizontally and they use uh, the power of fact checking. And the other thing is, I think, uh, I, I don't think there's always a technical solution or fix to every problem that we face. The problem of the internet and the social media, as we, we, we know right now, probably uh, is not going to take a technological problem. Probably the reason, like a lot of digital activists is, is creating uh, is awareness that we, we should really cultivate the digital uh, literacy among our citizens, because uh, well, it's, it's unfortunate that many of our senior citizens, that uh, these people may be not that sophisticated, that they just, they, they don't really spend too much time or too many years in, in using the digital media. They might be easily victimized because they just saw a picture, but then not knowing that any picture can be forged uh, in the cyberspace. So I, on the other hand, if it was a, like a digital natives, that they, these people really grew up with the environment. So they know that it, it could be, uh, it could be uh, fake. Eh? And also uh, most of the young people would know that uh, you have to verify the source of information. But for a lot of fake news that get uh, viral on the internet is that they literally come, come from nowhere. And, and it's, uh, people who spread that, uh, or transmit that really don't want to double check. So, uh, so I think that old school measure that you really uh, want to uh, uh, cultivate a certain awareness among the citizenship, I think would be probably the best immunization of this inform information, misinformation campaign or disinformation campaign. I'll stop here. Thank you. So I guess all of us really emphasize the relevance of literacy, raising awareness, political education in general, and maybe that's the way forward for the academia too in uh, trying to answer the question about how to democratize the internet, contribute to these efforts at digital literacy, awareness, and um, education in general. So I think uh, our time is up. But uh, thank you again very much to the panelists, to CGI, to the uh, Brazilian Internet Steering uh, Committee, and for my colleagues uh, and students at the University of Brasilia who helped us organize this event uh, today, and the employees of the Internet Steering Committee as uh, well. Thank you very much. And especially thank you very much to Paulo Gerbaldo and Ming Shoho for making the time. We know uh, it's hard for making the time to be here with us today. I will switch to Portuguese just to say goodbye and thank you. Muito obrigada pela audiência. Muito obrigada a todos os participantes. Thank you for your audience. Thank you to all participants and see you soon.